So I'd like to read to you today out of Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, if you have your Bibles with you or if you'd like to check out the screen. Either way, it will be available to you. And by the way, if you are here and you don't have a Bible, like, there's no reason for that. We can get you a Bible, okay? So you can just stop uh, out at the info table, not right now, but after service, and um, we can get a Bible into your hand. We want to make sure that everybody has a copy so that you can go home and read the Word, too. Or you can use your phone. I mean, just Bible.com. It's great. Okay, let's read. Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving, not with complaining, with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Let's pray this morning. God, we believe that your word has a transforming power to it. And we as your students want to come to be transformed by your word. So Lord, would you do that work today? Would you allow us to dive deep, to see the mysteries of your word as realities? so that we can live out what you have called us to do and who you've called us to be. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, last weekend we kicked off this series. It's called the Remember Series. And it's funny that we're doing a series called Remember because I think there's like so many of the last, what, 20 months now that we wish we could forget. (laughs) Am, Am I wrong in that? And I don't just mean the pandemic. I know that there are circumstances that even go beyond that, that we all have walked through, that we've all experienced, that have been hard, that have been trying on us. And I I do want to challenge you, though, that if you really take yourself and you, you give yourself an opportunity to look back on the last 20 months, I guarantee if you are looking for the praiseworthy moments, you will find them. You will find them. But I have been guilty of this. In seasons of struggle and seasons of pain, I have completely blocked out moments in my life. Has anybody ever done this? Like, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know what it's called. But, like, almost to, like, preserve yourself from pain, you completely block out memories, right? Like, my high school experience, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, were very traumatic for me. And so there are parts of my high school career, career? Yes, career. Um, that I completely block out because they were so painful to me. But if I am not careful and I don't recall to remembrance that season of my life, I will also miss that right in that moment is where I met Jesus and he changed my life. So I want to encourage you to reflect and remember your journey with Jesus because when we do that, we'll find healing in places that are still painful. I was reflecting on my high school experience preparing for this message, and it was very painful for me. And I said, okay, if that still hurts, there's some healing that still needs to happen in my life. And you give yourself opportunities to do that. It's a healthy thing to do. But it also encourages me to remember where Jesus met me on my journey. Not just when I first met him, but along the way. And this is the power of our lives as living testimonies of the faithfulness of God. Just like the woman at the well who just had a chat with Jesus, sat there thinking she was just going to go about her normal daily duty, and here was, yes, I said duty, and here was Jesus (laughs) who said, for all of us children in the room, um, and here comes Jesus sitting right next to her and saying, hey, let me tell you everything you ever did, and let me tell you where you can find refreshing living water where you will never be thirsty and she said what and her life was changed and she went from that place which I'm assuming she still had to walk through painful moments after that encounter with Jesus but yet she went back to a village and she was able to testify of the goodness of God 
without a Bible college degree, she went and told a whole village about the power of the living God. I was talking about testimonies recently with uh, Elijah Hernandez, who is playing guitar this morning, one of our outlet students. And he, we, he's getting ready to do a, a, a devotional at school to teach the other kids the, about the beauty of your own testimony. And we're sitting there and we're exchanging testimonies. And I'm getting fired up. He's getting fired up. And everybody around the table is getting fired up because of what God has done in our lives. And when we put those things in focus, when we remember what God has done, our lives are changed. They're different. We have to live different. My, my mentor, um, Marian Ingenieri, love her. Uh, she's been here to speak um, before. And she, has, she says this thing, and I kind of stole it and made it mine. Um, but she says, I cannot unsee what I have seen. That's the same thing about the power of God. I cannot unsee what he has done. I cannot unexperience what he has experienced, so I must remember who he is. And that is the whole purpose of this series. So I just unpack that for you. You're welcome. Last week, Pastor Tim spoke about this church remembering that we are a house of healing. Wasn't that a good word? Incredible word. I encourage you to go back and listen to it again because it was really powerful. But remembering that we are a house of healing causes us to live differently. I can't go out with the same mentality, right? I've been edified, and I have to live differently as a person who walks in healing and what that looks like. And today I get to bring another vital area of focus of what God has said about this church so that we can remember and we can walk that out together and we can live differently. Amen? Okay, so in order to do that, we have to walk down memory lane. Are you ready? Yeah? Okay, again, we're all going to talk. Like you're, it's like you're in my living room. I know this is God's house, but it's like you're in my living room and we're going to just have a chat. So if you don't know the history of this church, if you're fairly new and haven't heard the story, um, the church that we are in right now, Lancaster Foursquare Church, is a 90-plus-year-old church. Um, Soon, in a matter of short years, we're going to be celebrating 100 years of ministry in the Antelope Valley, which is incredible. And 10 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, there was a little church plant called Life Church, a little church plant that could, (laughs) <laughs> you all laugh because you know. Uh, and together, those two churches merged um, uh, seven years ago. Seven? No, how many years ago? Six. Thank you. Six years ago, we merged together, and this is the life church that we know and love today. And it's a beautiful, beautiful story. But seven years ago, the little church plant that could, uh, Life Church, we were on the boulevard. We were on the corner of Lancaster Boulevard and Beach. And we were right behind a tattoo shop. It was so cool. It, like, we were hardcore, okay? It was awesome. It was so awesome. And um, uh, I remember just wanting so desperately because we were in the heart of the city. We just felt like being at Lancaster Boulevard, so close to City Hall, we were at the heart of the city, and we took that seriously. And, you know, we were just so excited. And, and Tim and I would find ourselves, though, not walking down the boulevard too often. We would actually go and walk down Beach. And maybe you've never been down those streets. Maybe you've never been in those neighborhoods around um, off the boulevard, but our hearts were drawn to that street, and so we just committed, we're going to do laps. We're just going to walk, and we're going to talk to anybody who is outside on their patio. We're going to talk to anybody who might let us inside their gate. <laughs> they all had gates. It was weird, um, but, but it makes sense because as you're walking, you could feel the despair. You could feel the hopelessness. You know, some of the homes were in disrepair. It was poor shape, um, but you could feel this sense of hopelessness. And so we're walking these laps, and our, our hearts are just, like, so um, broken, but also encouraged at the same time. It's like that weird thing that God does when you see the hope for a place. And when we originally planted our church, we were like, you know this, Tim. Let's, let's just say it. We said, we're going to reach the entire Antelope Valley. It's going to be Life Church, and we're going to reach the entire Antelope Valley. And, like, that is a good and noble thing to say. And I just remember walking down beach, and God was like, that's real cute, 
Like, not condescending, because God is really sweet, right? But, like, that's really cute, and that's noble, but what if you just reach beach? What if you just reach beach? What if that's all you'll ever do? Will that be enough? Will that be enough for you? Could you position your focus on something that is right in front of you? And I remember it vividly. And I remember crying because I'm like, God, we want to be like out there, big. And my heart just broke house after house that we passed that I was looking and seeing and in envisioning, right, not in a judgmental way, but a very realistic way of, of imagining the stories of the people behind those doors. And I knew what we were going to do. We were going to be intentional. That's what we were going to focus on, intentional connection, intentional service. Regardless if a family ever walked through our doors or worshipped with us, we were there, we were planted there to serve them, Period. I remember just story after story of people who never came into our doors, but we knew their story. We knew their names. We knew how many kids were in their homes. We knew what they needed. Deb, I remember connecting with a a family who had a young girl who was going through um, cancer treatment. And Vacation Bible School was the first time that this girl was able to be with her peers. I mean, life-changing stories when we set our focus on what was right in front of us. And the Lord opened many more opportunities. He started expanding it to other streets that were right next to it because we were faithful, because we were intentional. And then we started doing things in in the community at large, and from that, iHeartAV was born. So if you never knew, that's where iHeartAV started. And we literally took the iHeartNY design I looked it up. It's okay. They're okay with it, us using the design. But we wrote I Heart AV. And we were intentional about wearing those in places that the community would see them, like the Poppy Festival. And people would look at us like we were crazy. And it was great because it started conversations. We taught everybody to start changing their language about the Antelope Valley that it was not a place where dreams come to die, but a place where the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit breathes life into weary souls. I mean, you're here and you're cool, right? (laughs) And Lancaster Foursquare Church, the, the church that had many, many years on us, on our church plan, it's been known of a place where there was the literal tagline of sharing the life of God with the Antelope Valley. That was the tagline of this church. And so these two moments for these two churches as they merge, because you know we inherit each other's history when a church merges. And those were pivotal moments in the church's history that positioned us to what we declare as I Heart AV. So that's your history. And I know what people say about the AV. Listen, the church even follows a meme page that makes fun of the Antelope Valley. I've seen them. You've seen them. The Simba one where you see, you know. I'm not even going to explain it to you guys. There's no denying that there is, this is a rough area. There are places that you don't drive to at night that you avoid. Am I wrong? We've seen the brokenness right in front of us as we've served grace resources. We listen to stories. I'm not going to try to glamorize the AV to you today, but I am here to say that the Lord has declared that this church would love its community. Amen? Amen. So we're going to move forward into that. So how do we actually do this? Because it's cool to have a t-shirt. Real cool. It's cool to say that you love the AV. But how do we actually walk this out? And I don't know if we've ever taught it in such a way as we're going to teach it today. So are you all ready? Okay, let's remember what God has said. Because it is a collective call for this church, but it is also the individual call that he has asked of all of us. So Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6 again. We're going to read it again. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. 
At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Just a little bit of context. Paul is writing this letter to the Colossian church because there was heresy everywhere. Misrepresentation of Jesus happening all over. It was concerning. And it was leading people astray, believers astray, and then they were sharing misrepresentations of Jesus. You know, it's a spiral. It's a cycle of just a mess. But it sounds very similar to the issues that we have today. We just have digital platforms on it. And if you don't type amen to something, you might go to hell. Um, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen those things. That was a joke. That's fine. <laughs> Paul is writing this letter to them in prison. He was showing them that he was willing to suffer for the gospel because he had a vision of the kingdom. He had a vision for all of these churches that had been planted to succeed and to go out and make disciples of all nations. The true Jesus had rescued him from a destination of hell and everybody else who was a believer at the time, and there was no way that they could keep it in for themselves. They needed to share it out. So Paul was encouraging the church to remember what God had done so that they could go out and live differently because of it and proclaim the true gospel to the people. So he's very specifically talking about the Great Commission. Very specifically. And that's a call on every believer's life. It is not just a call for those extroverted friends of yours, you know the ones, who love evangelism too. A double, Marcus, I'm talking about you, sir. I have too often relied on Tim in a situation with, you know, people to take the lead, right? Because I'm an introvert. I shouldn't have to be expected to do anything that would take me out of my comfort zone. The Lord made me. I'm here to tell you today, he has also called you introverts to go and proclaim the good news of the gospel. You don't get a pass, and extroverts... You don't get a pass either. You can't just talk about the things that you want to talk about. you got to talk about the gospel. Okay, i got to clap there. Okay. <laughs> Paul is talking to all of us. We are meant to boldly proclaim Jesus. So here we are, a moment for us to remember why we heart the AV. It isn't just through events, it isn't just through fancy shirts, or even just saying that we do, but it is by intentionally looking at the people that we are surrounded by and sharing the gospel with them. And if that just made you super nervous, welcome to the club. We have some clear instructions from Paul, though, that I think will help to take the edge off. You are going to be uncomfortable. It is, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry, actually. (laughs) It is what it is, what God has called us to do. It is a gift that comes with responsibilities. Yes, you can bring folks here in this place to hear the preached word, but it still does not leave you off the hook. And I have to say these things, church. I have to. Because if we're entering a new year, a new season, and we're being called to remember the things that have been said over this church, we all have a part to play in that. And I want to see you win. So this is how we show love to the AV. Are you ready? Number one, Say prayer. Say, yeah, let's try it. That's okay. Church choir, come on. Say prayer. 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 They were specific prayers that he was mentioning in this, um, in these scriptures. The first one that I want to focus on is open doors. Say open doors. Open doors. Let it be so, Lord. Why? Because if we have to pray that there are open doors, obviously there are closed doors. There are obstacles that are in the way of the gospel going forward. It wasn't Paul saying, hey, can you guys pray that these prison doors would open? He could have very well said, pray that the prison doors would be open so that I can go and evangelize on your behalf. He did not say that. 
He said, pray that there would be open doors concerning the gospel. He recognizes that there's a bigger picture and a bigger call on your life and mine. And he says to pray for open doors. We need to pray and do spiritual warfare. And in Ephesians 6, Paul tells us that our fight isn't against each other, flesh and blood. It's against powers, principalities, spiritual forces. This isn't just a movie thing, guys. This is real. There is darkness in this world, and he tells us to put on our spiritual armor and to pray that there would be open doors. He says to stay alert. Stay alert in it with the tone of thanksgiving, not fear, the thanksgiving tone of saying, I believe that you are going to open these doors, Lord, that the gospel would go forth because we are in a battle of souls. The enemy does not want people to hear the gospel. He does not want it to go forward. Like, we are not in neutral territory here. We are in a battle. And when you go to share your faith, it's not like the person's an empty cup waiting to just receive all that you have. There are lies that have been spoken over people's lives. There's addiction. There's bondages. There's demonic forces. I mean, that's what you are encountering. I I wish I could tell you it's so much easier than that. It is not. So we need to pray that there will be open doors. And beyond that, we need to know when the doors are open. We need to pray that there would be wisdom to know when there is an open door. Specifically, Paul experienced this in Acts 16 when a man was calling to Paul during during his prayer time. And he said, go to Macedonia because I'm opening a door for the gospel to go forth. So you will have wisdom when you pray for open doors. Secondly, it is to pray that we would be able to proclaim the gospel clearly. I'm not going to have you repeat that. That's a lot of like, it might be a tongue twister. But pray that you would proclaim the gospel clearly. A clear message. Because Paul assumes, okay, next step, let's pray that we'll have a clear message. Because the doors will be open in Jesus' name. The doors will be open in Jesus' name. The battle will be won, and there will be an opportunity to share the gospel. And there needs to be a clear message. Why? Because there is a mess out there. Not many people read their Bible, guys. In America, not many people really know who Jesus is. They have an idea of who he is, but they don't have a clear understanding of his love. And they need a clear gospel message. And that is why we need to pray for it. Uh, Just a couple chapters before, Colossians 2, verse 8, it says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. Because that was, was what was happening in their time. That's what's happening in our time, guys. High, high sounding nonsense, empty philosophies. It's what's happening. When a door is open, we need to be praying that there will be a clear gospel message that is stated. And I meet so many people who feel disqualified in even sharing a clear gospel message because they feel like they don't have eloquent enough words. So they don't do it. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from experience, by the way. Yes, I have my pastoral license to preach, but there are moments when I feel inadequate to preach the gospel to lives that are so broken. But I'm here to tell you today, if we pray for a clear message, God will give us a clear message. Besides the fact that it's him working through us anyway. And it doesn't have to be on your own merit or your own talent. Thank you, Jesus. Because I'm not good enough, but I know he is. And just a reminder, Luke 10 asks, it says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers. Here you are. It's time to go out there and to proclaim the goodness of God. So we are called to pray. Next, we are called to proclaim. I know we just talked about proclaiming a clear message, but I mean you, your activity. And this isn't a division of labor here. This isn't like you get to choose whether you want to be a part of the prayer team or the proclamation team. You decide. Go to your teams. No. They go together. Prayer and proclamation go together. They work together. 
if we are to proclaim the goodness of the gospel in our lives, we need to proclaim it with our walk and with our word. Our walk, meaning our entire life, is to be used to proclaim the goodness of Jesus because actions do speak volumes. And right now, our society is full of people who are waiting, waiting to call out hypocrisy. They are waiting. I'm going to see that what you say that you believe doesn't line up with your actions. I am just waiting for it. And unfortunately, we're giving them a lot to work with. Take a beat. Just a reminder, the Lord had to work this through me first, so. If our actions are not aligning with what we claim to believe, how will they come to know the God of love in us? I mean, don't you love it when people are spending time with you and they're like, why are you different? How are you joyful? Don't you know, like literally, don't you remember your life circumstances? Do you forget? How are you still joyful? Why are you so loving? And I love it when we can respond in ways that say, I have received a love so amazing that I have to live different. Let me tell you why. Second Corinthians says that we carry around with us the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus can be proclaimed. Are you only carrying around bits and pieces of the Jesus that you know and love? Or are you carrying around the reality of the death of Jesus with you so that you can proclaim the life of him as well? So let your light shine before others. This will glorify your Father in heaven. This is our point, our key value of a church. We are living on purpose. This is what it means. We should be living out what Jesus would do if he was right here with us in this very moment. Verse 5 says to specifically act wisely towards outsiders making the most of time. Wisdom and intentionality. Two key parts of that verse. Having wisdom to know. Having wisdom to understand an environment that I am entering into. Wisdom that I can't come in prepared for. It's not like I can study for a test when I encounter a person. I need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And then to live intentionally means that we position ourselves in situation, in the situations where those open doors are, and we actively walk into them. I will tell you this too. If the people that you hang out with majority of the time or m most of the time are all believers, you may not be living as intentionally as you thought. That one hurt me. <laughs> that one hurt me big. Because I... I live here, basically. I got a job to do. But the Lord is saying, no, go. Live intentionally. Be in spaces where there are not believers who need the goodness of the gospel. Intentionality also means that you make a plan, expecting opportunities to come. You got the holidays coming up. How are you going to share Jesus with your coworkers? I understand there are company policies, I get it. The Lord gives wisdom if we walk intentionally making the most of every time. How can this holiday season be intentional for you to share the beautiful message of the gospel? So not, not only by our walk, but also by our word that we proclaim. By our walk, by our actions, but also our word, what we say. I know that there is this beautiful quote out there that is attributed to um, St. Francis of Assisi that says, um, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. You guys all know that quote? Well, some of you know that quote. I'll tell you this. this is a, a very nice quote, and I know that it's talking about our actions being really important, but I will tell you that that quote is also not biblical. Because the Bible definitely says, use words. It definitely says, proclaim the gospel message. 
nonverbal actions should always lead us to verbal communication, right? Romans 10, 14 says, how then can they call on him that they have not believed in? And how can they, how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And that's not just the pastors of Life Church. That is the carriers of the gospel, of the good news, that are called to go out and make disciples of all nations. I believe that God can totally encounter us in dreams and, like, lead us on a journey to find the Bible. But most of us found our way to Jesus because somebody told us. That is our job. That is our call. And we also have to be prepared in our speech, in our word, to answer questions. Questions from unbelievers who look at Christians' lives and don't understand the connection. Or Christians' lives who have maybe not make, made it known that they are human and also can fall into sin. And instead say, let me show you the, what the gospel really is and what being a Christian really looks like. Lastly, it says, let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt, full of grace, respectful, gentle, not bashing the word of God over someone's head, seasoned with salt, making it tasty, making people thirsty for more. Amen? So again, Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. We're just going to keep repeating this. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. And let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. So how do we love the AV Life Church? It's in the sharing of the good news of Jesus. And so here are some final tips in how we will not only remember what God has said to us as individuals, as collectively as this community, but also to live it out. So number one, these are tips. You ready? All right. Know your testimony. Know your testimony. Go find Elijah Hernandez. Ask him about the sandwich method. I know, it's almost lunchtime, and I said sandwich. Go ask him about the sandwich method. I kind of want to test him a little bit to see if he rem- remember. He knows. He knows what it is. But go ask him about the sandwich method, and he'll teach you how to share your testimony in like three minutes. It's going to be beautiful. Or take a lesson from Life Kids. Okay? If you can share your story to five-year-olds, you're probably doing a good job at sharing your testimony. And I mean that. I I know we all feel like we have to share these deep, dark stories, tragic stories, but really the meat of it is when you share when Jesus encountered you. If you can share your testimony to a five-year-old, you've got it down. And maybe uh, Miss Deb over there will give you an opportunity to share it in life, kids. What do you think? Okay. Practice it. If you have kids at home, we always um, have our messages and our sermons and stuff. Uh, go through what we call the Sela test. And she's getting older, so it's harder to say that, but, um, but we, uh, we would process it through. Could she understand it if she was in the room? If so, perfect. Second tip, know the gospel basics. Know Jesus. If you are confused about Jesus, if you are confused about something in the Bible, guess what? You've got people here who will help you. 
memorize some verses, have them in your pocket at all times because you never know when the door will be opened and the opportunity will present itself. Study. The next tip. Actually listen to people. I know. Like, close your mouth and listen to people. Ask questions when you need clarity. Hear about their life. Hear about their faith traditions, even if they don't match with yours. Figure out where they are on their journey. Find that open door. It's there. Think about the people in your life that you're like, I, I would love for them to come to know Jesus. I know there's overachievers out there that are like, all oh, people. But I mean like the people in your life that you're just like, I've got, f- I've got five. That's my big list, right? If you can tell me where they are on their journey, then you've probably listened to them enough. If you don't and you have no understanding, you probably haven't listened to them enough. Engage. Next one is to anticipate needs. Anticipate needs. Yes, you are a concierge of where God has called you to be. There will be moments when you can provide support that are so creative that is, it's, like, it's like God wrapped it up and gave it to them themselves or himself. I know that the Lord will, pro- will provide those opportunities for you. Prepare answers and support. Okay? This is how we're going to love the AV. It's not going to be through a big event, though that might help, right? It's going to take us praying and proclaiming and asking for the Lord to send us. Could you tell him today that you want the opportunity? Could you literally sit there today and say, I want the opportunity. I may not feel completely confident, but I want the opportunity, Lord. We don't want I Heart AV to be, just be on a t-shirt. Tim, you're wearing the shirt today. You want to show them what the shirt looks like? We don't want it to just be on a t-shirt. <laughs> we want to actually move out from this space that God has given us to go and tell the gospel to the people of the Antelope Valley. And I get it. The Antelope Valley is a really big place. I feel like there's still places of the Antelope Valley I've never been to, and I've lived here a long time. Could you say the same? But I wonder if we asked and didn't make it so complicated or overwhelming, if we just said, God, would you just give us beach? Would you just give us K6 right out here? Would you just give us K6? That would be enough. Would you just give us Glen Court? That is, these are connected to the, um, right outside the church here. Or, Lord, would you give us, fill in the name of your street. That is enough. Would you give me the IT department at my work? I may not know one thing that they're saying or talking about, but would you give it to me, Lord? so that I could proclaim the good news. Or the coffee shop where they remember your name. Sorry, I did a little dig at somebody. I don't know who. (laughs) And I believe that there's people in this church who will be called to even the rougher neighborhoods of, of our city and have a grace and a call to go out and to serve this city. I'm praying for neighborhood impact to come back. I don't know why I'm looking at you guys, but you championed it. Let's find the heart again. So where is God fixing your focus, reminding you that this community is one that God loves and that God is calling us to? Fix your focus. Um, Use the tools and heed the call that God has given us in this scripture. So I wanted to prepare something really cute for you um, because I do this every now and then. I I feel like I talk to our team about it. And I even told Tim I was going to have this prepared. 
Um, I was, can I just tell you the story, story time? Okay, thanks. I see you. <laughs> um, I was going to give you guys uh, a gift to go out and give to all of the houses in the neighborhood. We've done that before, and I think that's a beautiful thing to do. And every time I tried to order supplies for it, it got canceled. Every single time. And I'm like, Lord, um, Sunday's coming. I need to be prepared for this. And it wasn't until Friday morning that the Lord was like, hey, guess what? You don't even need to order those things. We're doing something different. We're going to focus on what's right in front of us. So I am not, we're not going to provide an opportunity for like something that's pre-made to just go out and pass out and to feel good about it. Because those things do make us feel good and they are beneficial to our neighborhood. I don't want to knock that at all. But I think God is doing something a little bit more strategic and personal coming from your heart. Okay? So it takes a little bit of explaining. But this, this Christmas season, we're going to have a um, tree in the foyer. And it's going to be a giving tree. And as you engage with the place where God has called you to go and proclaim the gospel, and as you go and meet people and build relationships with people, I guarantee you needs are going to come up. I guarantee you. And I think that the Lord will give you provision to be able to handle some of those needs. But there will also be moments where I think you might need some help from your community of faith. And this is what Life Church does, right? When there's a need that's too big for me to fill, I bring it to the community and I say, help. That's a word. But we're going to have a giving tree out, out front. And as you engage with your neighborhood or where, wherever God has called you to go, and you hear, so and so needs groceries, so and so doesn't have any um, Christmas gifts for their kids, you're going to come to church, you're going to fill out a tag, and you're going to place it on the tree. And somebody within the congregation will have the opportunity, if they would like to, and they feel led of the Lord, to take that tag and fill that need. And there will be instructions on there. Don't worry. It won't be an organizational mess. I gotcha. Okay? Have you covered here. But this is how we're going to do this this holiday season. So engage. Fix your focus. Pray and proclaim that the goodness of the gospel would be known in the Antelope Valley, not just by our events or things that we can give away to the neighborhood, but by you sharing the good news of the gospel. Amen? So to, to close up today, I know it's been our practice as of late that there's a weekly prayer. And so I want to encourage you to, um, to pray this with me. We're going to get it up on the screen for you all, but I thought it'd be cool if we could all read it together. Would that be okay? And if it gets all like everybody's off in a different timing, it's fine, okay? It's okay. But could we get up on our feet, and could we make a commitment today that the Lord, if you're able to, sorry, if you're able to get on your feet, but the Lord has given us a gift a gift of Jesus, yes, absolutely, 100%. And also a gift of being planted in this community. And so we're going to pray this together. And we're going to make a commitment to the Lord that we understand the reality of the gift that he's given us. Amen? Let's read this together. Dear God, we thank you for planting us in the Antelope Valley. We pray for open doors to share your good news. Help us to be wise and intentional in every moment. Help us to share clearly who you are with others in our community in a gracious way and full of the flavor of your love. Help us to fix our focus to where you have called us to proclaim the gospel. Help us to love the AV the way you love the AV. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, as your church is standing right now, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint them, 
That means to set them apart for your work, for your glory. Give them the confidence that they need. Speak to them even now with your instruction to go and be sent out today to share the gospel, to share your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.